He is more than you could ever need. He's more than the eye could see. I don't deserve his love, but he's always been there for me. You see, Jesus met me when I was at my lowest. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. He is the greatest example of generosity this world of greed has ever seen. And when Jesus hit the scene, he changed the scenery and met diversity with serenity. If you're looking for peace, he offers plenty. Jesus was and Jesus will forever be king. And when the angels sing, they sing of the grace that was displayed for sinners like me. I can't explain him and I can't describe him. And if I could, he wouldn't be Jesus because you can't explain eternity and you can't comprehend the galaxies. But it was the loving hands of Jesus who spun them into existence and created man knowing he would go to the cross to pay our sentence there was a certificate of judgment with a period after the sentence and we were sentenced to death long before he said it is finished he is a father to the orphan a shelter for the homeless a hiding place for the abused and an anchor for our storms he stormed the gates of hell and came out on top and the power of his gospel cannot be stopped even when the world tries and they try a lot he traded places with Barabbas and became the catalyst of missions across the world covering every portion of the atlas. If you're in need of rest, I know of a mattress. If you don't know Jesus, your future is tragic, but he gladly embraced tragedy so we could live in his presence of majesty. His presence is presence, and it's his presence that presents preciousness to a world of peasants. He is far from pretentious, but still loves those who are. He is the light of the world and hung the stars. He brings the dead to life and delivers life to the dead. He took a crown of thorns on his head so we could put crowns at his feet, and I can't wait until I get to kiss his feet that were nailed to a cross for me and for you and for every person around the world. He loves the world and I love his word because the word became flesh and in his flesh he demonstrated the word to the world. He is an example to every boy and every girl. He is a lover of black people. He is a lover of white people. He is a lover of the unchurched and the assembly under the steeple. He doesn't see the believers failures but still takes time to celebrate their faithfulness. It's the power of the spirit that enables us and gives us boldness when the world labels us. And if you want to label me, please call me a Jesus freak. If that freaks you out, good. Because it's better to be good with God than to fight being misunderstood by a world that could never understand. So let it be understood that I don't worship man, we worship Jesus. And although he doesn't need us, he still sees us and pleads with us to run to the cross where he bled for us. His heart bleeds for us, his heart grieves for us, but still graciously grants us a pardon for our treason in a season where the world tries to explain away the work of the spirit with human reasoning. There is a reason they can't. Because the spirit is like the wind and the wind cannot be seen. But loved is the one who believes without seeing the unseen. I'm telling you today that Jesus is something. He's something more. He's something great. And if you want to know him, you don't have to wait. He stands at the narrow path with a key to the gate and you only have to reach out and embrace his grace. I don't care who's president. I have a king who is always present. I don't care who holds musical celebrity. The voice of the Lord will always be the sweetest melody. I don't care who owns the riches of the globe. My Jesus holds more wealth than one ruby on his robe. I don't care who is the strongest or the fastest. Nothing matches the creator of the universe and his immortal infinite status. I don't care about religious leaders who died and stayed dead. I'll only worship the one who conquered death and wears a crown on his head. His name is Jesus, and I'm telling you, he's something. He was faithful yesterday, and he is faithful today. I can feel his presence whenever I pray. And when the time comes for me to fade away, I'll remember the day I heard him say, My name is Jesus. morning. The name of Jesus, it has, even in the first century, uh, caused a stir and been found offensive. This morning I was reading um, in Acts 4 where Peter and John were out uh, preaching and healing in the name of Jesus and they were called before the religious leaders uh, and they, they said this, um, this Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people, and we must be saved by it. Um, in every partnership, ministry and mission partnership that Calvary's a part of, the, the message of the gospel has to continue to be the centerpiece. It has to be the name of Jesus has to continue to be spoken. Uh, we can feed the hungry, but if we don't point them to the bread of life, we really have not loved them. Um, and I, I love that about everything that this church is involved in, uh, particularly in these next two weeks as we celebrate what God is doing in our mission and ministry partnerships around the globe 
and uh, in our own community. The gospel is centered. Um, and I pray that we will continue to be a church uh, that says what they said that day later on in Acts. It says, for we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. The name of Jesus has to continue to be on our lips. We are so glad that you are here today. We welcome you. If you are a guest with us, we want you to know that we are so happy that you're here. We, we're glad that you chose to worship with us today. If you would, there's a guest card in the seat in front of you. Just take a minute, fill that out, and later in the off, during the offering, you can drop that in. We ask you to do that primarily because we just want to know who you are. We want to know how we might can love you and minister to you, and that's a way for you to share that with us. So if you would do that, we would consider that a favor and be so grateful if you would take time to do that this morning. Um, I'm excited about what God has for us this morning, and I want us to begin uh, in prayer. Would you join me? Father, we are so in need of you. Some of us have come here today not, not even aware that we need you, and, and some of us are, are keenly aware of it. Father, I ask that in this, in this moment, in this time, as we worship you, as we hear from your word, that you would open our minds and our hearts to our need. Father, it is the heartbeat of this church that we would continue to speak the name of Jesus. There is no other name where hope and redemption can be found. And we all stand in need of that. Show us our hearts this, this morning, Father. Help us to um, humble ourselves at that truth and look to you. It's in the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Y'all stand and join us in worship. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn. Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Oh, man. 
sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you call me a citizen of Righteous ones will answer him, Lord, do, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothing and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Uh, as part of the ministry team, on behalf of them, I wanted to introduce to you, the church, four areas of ministry we really want to focus on when it comes to verse 40, the least of these you did for me. And the first, and, and we're going to be passing out these cards at the end of the service, the little magnets. Get them, pray over it. It says, give, pray, go. And it's talking about the prisoner, the orphan, the widow, and the poor. Sandra asked me to be kind of over the orphans. And it's, it's really a good fit because y'all know that Allie and I do the foster care program. And when you think of orphan, you think of somebody who doesn't have a father, right? Well, we've had five kids in our house with foster care. Guess how many have had a father? Zero, right? So no father. And it's I'm telling you, if a kid doesn't have an earthly father, it's really hard to draw that connection to a spiritual father. Um, and some of y'all might even agree you might have had an earthly father that just didn't connect, that wasn't a good earthly father, and it's really hard to make that connection to a spiritual father. And as a father, men in the church, we can make such a difference in these children's lives, these orphans' lives, by showing them what a good father looks like, what a good family looks like. The Bible says in Psalm 68, 5, it says, He is father to the fatherless. Um, the guy rapping up there, kind of, I guess that was a rap. Max leaned over and said, is he rapping? But uh, he was pretty impressive, and I started to get up here and do that. But uh, no. <laughs> but he did motivate me when he said that right off the bat, Psalm 68, 5. And, and I tell you, man, it, it is something to see. Um, it's a blessing for the kids to see what a true father looks like. But golly, it's a blessing to us. Allie and I have been blessed so much by doing foster care. Um, telling you everything in your body says no I want my family I want I want it to be like it is we've got ball games we've got volleyball we've got all this but take the time and reach out to another kid that doesn't have a dad and love them and they'll understand then that they have a true father in heaven um, and like I say if, if you're feeling a spiritual lull if you're feeling down or if you're feeling like your faith hadn't grown then do what God says because when you obey God Guess what's going to happen? Your faith is going to grow. Happens every time. Um, Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 14:29 says that when you feed these orphans, these widows, guess what? You're going to be blessed. And I can tell you tenfold, Allie and I have been blessed. And I'm not always wanted to do it. Um, you know, we got rid of Elmer. I hate to say it that way, but the state took Elmer from us probably a couple months ago. And he was a blessing. I mean, I was able to baptize Elmer. And, and that's another thing. If you're, you love that kid and you show them love of Christ, and we all did this, I'm not saying everybody can, but if we did, I promise you that baptism pool would be full of kids. 
getting baptized weekly. Who wouldn't want to see that? That is a blessing. But I go back, and we were, we were coming home from New Mexico, a ski trip. And Elmer had been gone maybe two weeks, and I loved my family time. I was, I was glad to have my family time back. I was, you know, being a little bit selfish. And Allison got a text message saying, hey, there's this little girl named Haley. She needs a home. So Allie looks at me, and she's like, you want to do it? I was like, nope. And um, she said, we're going to do it. And I was like, oh. So y'all know Allie. She's pretty direct, so I just go with it sometimes. It's better not to fight. But my heart wasn't in it. So the first night we get Haley home, she's right beside us. We put a p- little pallet beside the bed and tucking her in. But, you know, I'm still not in it. And I'm doing my the devotion or my Bible study. And the way my Bible study is, it, it has a verse up top. And you go to your Bible and you read it. And then you, you read the Devo and you journal on it. Um, and I went to the verse and it was Matthew 18, 5. I'm like, I read it and I had to reread it because like, what? And Matthew 18, 5 says, Whenever you welcome a child in your house, you welcome the Lord. And dude, I got chills, cheered up, handed the Bible to Allison and said, can you read this, make sure I'm reading this right? And then I looked over to Haley, who was asleep, and I'm like, I just welcomed the Lord in my house. Is that not a blessing? So if you're looking for a blessing, welcome these children, guys, and get involved with us in this ministry team. Adrian just read, I was in prison and you visited me. We have a group of ladies that do this each week with um, Freedom 13 Ministries with Lindsay Crawford. We go to visit a group of ladies that are in a very difficult place in their life. And they need to hear a message of hope, a message of forgiveness, and a message of love. They need to know that life can be new, that there um, is freedom in Jesus. So each week they hear that message. We bring the gospel to them. Some have responded several over the past just really a couple of months maybe seven we've even had baptism and um i wanted to share with you about one of these that have changed she describes herself as a uh, career criminal and she said that they had given her the label of a narcissistic um, sociopath but she is a new creature and she is thirsty for the word of God. She's read the word of uh, the Bible through like maybe two times since September when she was saved. She, she's hungry to read any literature we bring her, um, anything about God. And I love to hear her speak. They said even her appearance has changed. People that knew her before said she even looks different. But she can testify that there is only one way you can change, and that's through Jesus. And there's only one way you can keep going day after day, and that's to stay in his word. If you have uh, a woman here, if you feel that call to go with us, we'd love to have you go. Uh, meet with Lindsay Crawford. She'll get the paperwork to you. Or meet with Sandra or with me, and we'll get you in contact with Lindsay. Now, you are think- maybe thinking, but I don't want to teach. Some people have that gift. If you want to teach, we'd love for you to be in the rotation. But you may have that gift of encouragement just to go, like Adrian said, to come and visit to listen to them, to let you know that you love them and that you're concerned. Um, We mentioned pray, also pray, give, and go. So I've talked about how to go. But to pray, you know that on Friday mornings, I'm telling you now, we go at 9 o'clock. We're an army of light marching into darkness to do battle. So please pray for us. This is a very dark place. Satan doesn't want to let go of what he has. And another way you can help is by giving. There are two needs that we need just about every week, and that is Bibles. They request Bibles. And, of course, we want to make sure that that's in their hands. Um, And reading glasses, reading glasses of varying strengths. You can give this individually, or your small group may even get together and decide you'd like to make a donation of some Bibles or of some reading glasses. Or you can just give the money, and we can make those purchases. Another area that is related to this that we're just beginning to wade into, and that's offering encouragement to these ladies once they get out. You know, um, the forces of darkness are waiting with open arms to welcome them back into that life that they, some of them are leaving. They know that there can be new life in Christ, and it's scary to to re-enter society. When I first went, one of them asked, do you have something like this? They meant a Bible study. Do you have something like this? this for us when we get out and at that point it was like well no but we'll get something well now I can tell you we do offer them a meal on Wednesday night and a Bible study 
Some of them need encouragement in different ways. So if you're interested maybe not in going on Fridays or participating that way, but you're maybe interested in being an encourager to these ladies once they get out, please see me. Our church just finished a study of First Peter, and I want to leave you with three verses. Um, they are, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So not, let's not work, love with just words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. So let's get busy. Thank you. Y'all stand and join us again in worship.
My name is uh, Louis Cherrier. I guess you can tell from my accent I'm from South Louisiana. But I pastor, uh, I pastor three churches. One is Washington Baptist Church in your I've been there almost 25 years. And uh, about three years ago, we started one in Cottonport uh, in Evolves Parish. It's called the Bayou Life Church. And this church is a partner with that work. And in fact, y'all coming, I think, April the 14th on that Saturday to do a uh, some gospel singing and uh, hot dogs and those different things and a boulevard. And then we just started another church uh, last August in Marksville. It's a town of about 7,000 people. It's called the Red River Church. It's right across the shopping center. And so uh, when you get down in our area, just south of Alexandria, a lot of people think we're in a foreign country. And, and, and it is. Uh, just uh, We started churches among the... Uh, Mosquitoes, alligators, snakes, you name it, out there. And I have a song that I want to do. It's called The Little Church on the Old Bayou. And it kind of makes you think of South Louisiana and what it's like out there. There's a little church down in Louisiana. It's a little church on the old bayou. Folks come to church and the trucks and the cars. They even come to church on the O.P. road. Hey, they sing and they praise till the sun comes down. And they clap their hands, dance around. There's one thing I know for sure. There's nothing better than praising the Lord. Hey, keep it up. All them Cajun folks, they're so doubting their desires to praise the Lord. Bless them with hunting and fishing, a sweet little wife and cheering galore. Where they sing and they praise till the sun comes down, and they clap their hands, dance around. There's one thing I know for sure, there's nothing better than praising the Lord. Yeah, you hear it, If you go down to Louisiana, there's one thing you hear I know About the love I have for Jesus And the little church on the old bio Where they sing and they pray Till the sun comes down And they clap their hands, dance around There's one thing I know for sure There's nothing better than praising the Lord There's one thing I know for sure 
There's none better than praising the Lord. Hey! Okay, I want to go ahead and <clears throat> share a little bit of my past. Uh, as I said, my name is Louis Cherier. Uh, I want to tell you how I came to know the Lord. Uh, I grew up in a different religious background than Baptist. And uh, it wasn't until I was 24 years old that I walked into Baptist church for the very first time. I need to kind of go back a little bit through the years. I, I uh, graduated in high school in 1972, a small class B school, Hesmer High School. I ran track from the time I was in the uh, sixth grade, seventh grade, all the way through. Went to state several times, had a full paid scholarship to run track for Northwestern in Natchitoches. And, uh, you know, coming from a small school, Class B, I was kind of a hero there in that little town of four or five hundred people. And I was really a very self righteous person and prideful. My first semester in college, some event happened that really broke me and really got me searching. As I grew up through the years, uh, back in 1967, I had a little sister, sister that was born, her name was Jackie, and Jackie was uh, very sickly, in and out of the hospital. And my first semester in college in September of 1972, Jackie died in my dad's arms. And you imagine at college and coming back and hearing those news, and I began to ask God, where, where did Jackie go? Will I ever see Jackie again? Is she in heaven? Do I know that I'm going to heaven? And, I, and my whole purpose, it's not that I didn't continue to run track, but my whole focus in life began to change. I said, there's an eternal God out there, and I know that he exists, and I need to know how to know him. It had began a hunger and a passion deep down inside. It wasn't until... Five, uh, several years later, in 1978, 1978, my wife and I both got saved. In fact, tomorrow, March the 12th, will be 40 years that my wife, both got, my wife and I both got saved on the same Sunday at Calvary Baptist Church. Not this Calvary Baptist, the one in Alexandria. But I, have to understand, I want you to understand how frightful we were to go to a Baptist church. As I said, I'd never been in a Baptist church. Uh, all through those years, not for a wedding, not for a funeral, not anything. And, uh, and so uh, we finally got enough courage to visit a Baptist church in February of 1978. We went to Calvary Baptist. And we got in the parking lot. We looked at each other and said, look, we've got to have an evacuation plan to get out of this church in case, in case it gets real tense. You know, you just never know what could happen in, in a church like that. And so we, uh, we got in the church. The deacons met us, and we went up the staircase, set up in the balcony. Wasn't quite as many up in the balcony. And uh, the choir came and began to sing, and God began to deal with my heart as they began to sing one song after the next. And my wife said, You're crying. She said, What are you crying? I said, I don't know. I, I can't explain what it is, but something is happening. And, and uh, in a way that I've never been touched before, I just don't know what it is. She pulled a handkerchief out, I was crying, and, and that we stayed for the whole service. At the end of the service, the pastor was right at the door. I was not used to that in the church I went before. I said, Why is he standing in the door? I said, maybe we should have left early. I said, he's trying to block that door. But he was just wanted to shake hands. And he went, to, he went to invite us to Sunday school. And I didn't know what that was. I said, you know, I've gone to school five days a week. What is school on Sunday? I didn't, I didn't even know what that was. And so he invited us to go. Next Sunday we came to a young couple's class. And uh, I, as, uh, as we, we met, it was during, just before Easter at this time of the year. And they were talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection in the Sunday school class. And, and I looked at these young couples, and they were my age, my wife's age. And I, I could tell from their prayer requests, I could tell from their testimony, I could hear the way they talked about the Lord and the scriptures. I, I knew deep down inside, they know this Jesus more than, than I know. I know a historical Jesus, but know him in a personal way. And God began to work in my heart. And every time I, I, you know, we came back to Calvary Baptist Church the next Sunday, we went up the balcony again, all in the back. The third Sunday we came back, all the way in the last, the last pews. And the uh, fourth Sunday, I guess about in the middle, but by the time we got there, about the sixth or seventh Sunday, uh, on March the 12th, we both walked down the aisle and gave our life to Jesus Christ. 
And I want you to understand, people, that it's hard to deal with self-righteousness. Because, and I meet, as a church planner for years, I find people who believe they're going to heaven because they attend a Baptist church or a Catholic church or, or they've done good deeds and, and that. And, and they don't really understand the cross and the purpose and what, how, how we're separated from God because of sin. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes just before I got saved and said, you're lost, Lewis. You're going to hell. You, you were there 2,000 years ago. You drove the spikes. You cracked that whip on his back. You are guilty of putting him on the cross, but he loves you and he died for you. People, I want you to know that Sunday when I gave my life to the Lord, I had for years I had been going to confess to a man and, and, and do penance and those things. But it wasn't until repentance came and I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and that load of sin for all these years was lifted up and I knew something had happened inside of me. It wasn't easy going back to my parents and my wife to her parents and that was ostracized, ridiculed, paid a price. I knew that would happen. But eventually through the years, I led my mom to the Lord and my dad got saved on his deathbed. Well, the, the reason that I'm here today is that to share about missions and church planting, and I'm kind of shifting gears here to, that I've been a church planter for a little over 30 somewhat years. And uh, God called me to preach. I got saved in 1978. Two years later, I uh, surrendered to preach in 1980. And I struggled. I didn't, when God was called me to preach, I, I, I was like Moses at the burning bush. I had one excuse after the next. I said, God, you've got to be making a mistake. I, I will have an experience, you know, in, 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 in a Baptist church background. You know my religious background. I know I'm a very shy person. In fact, when I was in school, I could rarely face a girl and ask her for a date. I kind of looked down and, or I passed a note to one of my friends and said, could you give this to her and see maybe if we could have a date. This is that kind of person. And I couldn't have eye contact and they're just very shy. And so I, I said, God, you got the wrong person. You got the wrong person. And finally in January of 1981, I remember going outside on a clear night. We attended Youngsville Baptist Mission just outside of Lafayette on a clear night. And I said, God, I'm tired of running from you. I know that you call me. You don't have, I don't have much ability, but I'm available. And I want to be your vessel. And I want to preach God's word. And I want to go wherever you call me. And at that moment, people, when I surrendered to what God called me, and God may be dealing with some of you young people, maybe uh, a mission trip this coming summer, maybe ministry here in the Russian area, and, and you've been fighting and, and, and that. You have your life plan and that. But there's no greater life to be in the center of God's will and to follow him. And that peace came that night when I surrendered told to him to wherever he called me. And God began to open doors. I pastored and been a church planter. And we're now on our 18th church plant. Since 1986 was the first one. And just last year in August, uh, eight, number 18 was the Red River Church in Marksville. And that. So uh, let me kind of share a little bit with you some, few, some scriptures from God's word. It's going to connect to what, I, what I'm saying. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verse 9, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he tells them that God had opened a door for him, speaking of Ephesus, and there were many adversaries. And people, I want you to know that God does open doors and God closes doors. And sometimes we wrestle with that. When God closes a door, we want it to open right then. God, he's, he's, he's got it closed because he knows the right time. And sometimes we bang at the door, we kick the door, and if the door won't open, I'll find a window I can crawl to, but I'm going to get through some way, somehow. And then sometimes we, we do things, and it was out of God's will. It fails, and we wonder, God, why, why is it not working? And God is saying, I didn't open the door at that time. Maybe God right now is dealing with someone, a door of opportunity for this church, a door an opportunity, maybe some of you college students, just, or just whatever, and a door is fixing to open. And that. And so I want to share three things about this door. Is I'm going to talk about the door of opportunity. It's going to be just a little short message. Door of opportunity, a door of obligation, and a door of opposition. And so the first thing when Paul writes about the door of opportunity, he talks about a door. He writes to the Corinthian church and says a door has opened in of opportunity in Ephesus. Ephesus was the banking center in the Roman Empire. It had the Temple of Diana. It was a tremendous amount of idolatry, a very hard people group to reach. But God was opening a door. And boy, are we glad that he went. 
one of his amazing jewels and books of the New Testament is the book of Ephesus. And he goes out there and he stayed, he stayed there for uh, like 18 months. It was one of his longest stays there and just a tremendous work out there. And God opens doors. And, and sometimes the door is closed and we know that there's, an, that there's a need. And you say, well, how can that door swing open? I have seen that as God's people come together and they pray and they fast, that's the hinges that holds the door. And as we pray, little by little, God cracks open the door because the devil oftentimes is on the other side. He's holding the door. He doesn't want the door to be open. He doesn't want God's people to go there. But through fasting and prayer, that door opens and God provides that opportunity. People, the door opens for just so long. I was uh, leaving the hotel this morning. Pressed the button. I was on the fourth floor. Ready to come? Get down and to come here. Went to Starbucks first. I haven't quite adjusted to this new new time, but anyway, but the, the elevator door opens and I, after a few seconds it closes and you come down and it opens again, and God is that way. And so the door of opportunity opens. And sometimes in our churches we say, well, I know the door is open, but we need to have we we got this committee, Lord, and and I know that we need to plan. And God, we got this committee, we had this meeting, we haven't come to a full conclusion, but God, the door's still open, and then, Lord, but we have another meeting in two, three months, and the door's still open, but it's about to close, and we have another meeting, and, uh, and one committed to check this committee, to check that committee, and on and on it goes, and, and God is saying, you know what, this door's about to close, but wait, God, we're going to have another committee meeting, and a fellowship meal here and there, and on and on it goes, sometimes in our church activity, and God says, you know what, you wait too long, that door is going to close, that I have opened that you prayed for and so I want you to know that God opens and closes doors I was at the Houston airport uh, just a few weeks ago my wife and three other ladies were coming back from Guatemala to uh, Casa Alleluia it's a huge orphanage in Guatemala and they were coming back and uh, I got I was to get a certain part of the airport and, uh, and the, the the door opens with this tram car it's all automated and this uh, this lady compu- computerized comes and talks and and then she says something like, hold on to your seat. It's fixing to leave with corridor uh, uh, B, and we're fixing to go to C. And it, it doesn't last long. And, man, that door closes. People, God oftentimes does the same. God opens his doors, and God closes his door. And when God opens a door, it's a door of, of, of opportunity. Sometimes some have prayed years before for a door of opportunity. And some, they have they have prayed, and they're no longer with us. Some have died, and they're in heaven. And you see a door open right now in 2018 that some years ago in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s prayed for. And when God opens a door, sometimes certain parts of the world, uh, nations, part of the globe, God says the door is open, but we don't go. It's a door of opportunity. All kinds of doors. I was sharing in the previous service how my wife felt led of the Lord to, uh, to try to have a, a, a ministry to our, the trash pickup guys. They come in this big blue truck, and it lasts a few seconds to come pick up your trash can on, at our house. It's on Monday morning. And so my wife had this little bench, metal bench, and she put a big sign, God loves you. And then on that bench, she put, uh, she put some bunch of honey buns and some uh, cold drinks and some, just different things there. So one time I went to McDonald's and got, got some stuff. But the first time she put it there, she was looking at the window, seeing, I wonder if it's going to get out. Well, it looks like the truck was about to take off, and all of a sudden the doors fling open, and these huge guys come out. And they walk, and they walk around this little table looking, is it safe? She's trying to poison us or something. What's going on? And, and finally, they, man, they, they pick, it, pick it up, and, and we, we didn't see anything from there. I said, well, praise God, they got it. And then about two weeks later, we, we did it again the second time. This time, they stopped a while. We thought maybe something had happened. Again, we're watching through the window, and, and they go in their glove compartment, I believe, and took this little piece of uh, cardboard. It was red, and wrote, thank you all so much. We know there is a God, and God, God loves us. A, a, a door had opened there. And we, we're still doing this. About every you know, two, three weeks sometimes, we might bake something, and that we'll put a gospel track. But that, I'm not saying that that's your door that's, that's open. You Maybe truck. Try that type of trash man ministry or something, whatever, a waste management ministry. But there's all kinds of doors. I have a door of opportunity at my house for 38 years. Let me tell you about this door of opportunity. I have five kids. I have two boys. I had three girls. But the oldest one, she was born in 1980. 
the same year I surrendered to preach. She was born at Doe Tree Hospital in New Iberia. And for four weeks, beautiful little girl, everything normal. One Friday afternoon, March of 28, 1980, my wife got in a terrible car accident. And, and, and my little girl that was just a, a model had severe head injuries. Doctor said that th she's not going to live. She's hemorrhaging in the brain. There's just all these things. But she's still with us after 38 years. People, after 38 years, we have health workers on this. I have never heard my daughter say one word to us. It's just little kind of baby words here and there, just things. What She never said one word to us. Can you imagine what it's like? She, she, she's never, she, she can't walk. We, we take her from the bed. This is seven days from the bed to her chair, to the chair, to the bed, turn her here and there. She cannot feed herself. Every, every, every bite, you know, uh, she's there with her hands like this, and we feed her uh, a bite of food and that. But you say, well, how can that be a door of opportunity? Because through the years, as different health workers have come, they, they, have, they, have, they have come and we've shared the gospel, and there's at least six health workers that have come to know the Lord through, through the years. So my daughter, she doesn't know what's going on, but, but, but her condition has brought these people that if maybe if that would never happen, they will never come to know the Lord. You know what my wife did one time? She had this little parakeet, and she trained this little parakeet to, to say this, this, these words. Are you saved? Are you saved? And, and he picked it up. It, 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 and so one day the Avon lady came to the house, and... My wife was trying to make an order, and the little bird decides, I'm going to speak. This lady's about to leave. Are you saved? She says, ma'am, I was looking at you, but is there somebody else in this house? No. And the little bird went again. Are you saved? And she says, oh, that's, that's my bird. I, I train him to uh, say, well, being the bird opened the door of opportunity there. Are you saved? And my wife had an opportunity to, to share the gospel. People, There's all kinds of ways. The, of, of doors of opportunity that God can open up. Amen? The second thing I want to share is a door of not only of opportunity, but a door of obligation. Paul is saying, I, I, I need to go. There's no excuses. You know, sometimes people say, well, I'm not sure if it's God's will to plant a church. I'm not sure if it's God's will to go out and witness. What? It is God's will. Open the Bible. Acts 1-8. The, the Great Commission. God plainly tells us. That what we need to do, we need to go. When God opens a door, it's a door of opportunity, a door of obligation. But the third thing, people, it's a door of opposition. Because so oftentimes as we're praying on the other side, there's, there's this, on the other side, there's God and there's Satan. And sometimes what Satan uses different things to keep the doors closed. It might be a false religion like Islam. It might be things that are happening out there. That keeps, that keeps people from, from sharing uh, the gospel. And then finally the door opens. A and Paul said there are many adversaries. I, I don't know all that Paul faced. We know that Paul, that uh, there was a riot that happened in Ephesus. And, and the goldsmiths and the silversmiths and those that made statues and that, they felt their business was being challenged. And he faced all kinds of things. And I'm saying that when you walk through that door, you never know what you're going to face on the other side. There may be opposition and pain, and suffering, but it's still the will of God to go. I'm going to close with this. One of the, our church plants is uh, in, in Church Point, Louisiana, just above Rain, uh, and uh, went there. I, I was there for about 10 years and we planted a church, but about two years after we planted that church, we had a man that donated two acres of land, and we moved the mobile chapel, uh, double wide trailer, and we, someone donated a, a bus. It, it was bright yellow. They call it the cheese. The cheese is coming down the road. And we pick up kids, and th there was kids, all the neighborhoods, blacks and whites, and the church. We had children's ministry uh, and all that. And uh, one day I went to the church. It was, uh, they we're not having church. I was going to do something there. And when I got there, I had made this big plywood sign about the church. And uh, I could tell it had been ravel or hit or something i i look real closely and man there was spread shot of bb's a uh, uh, shotgun i could tell had blasted my sign i said well i guess somebody 
doesn't like us, <laughs> is shooting at the sign like this. And so I looked on the sign, and there was a little uh, uh, Ziploc bag that was stapled to the sign. And so I pulled it off. I looked inside, and there was a note. Somebody had left. I, and so I made the connection. I said, I guess the shotgun blast and that note, they go together. They, they, they're leaving me a message. And so I opened it up, and it said, uh, the first visit is social. Don't let the next be business. Sign the KKK. They didn't want us to reach out to everyone. Do you know what I did with that note? I just tore it up, and I said, God, we're going to do your will, and we're going to continue to preach God's word. And that church is still going on. Amen. And so there is sometimes the adversary. There are doors of, of opportunity, but it also can be opposition. Thank you so much for letting me be here today. Amen. Certainly the most important door of opportunity for you to walk through is the one that Jesus Christ opens for you. Scripture says in Revelations, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and he with him, and he with me. One day, not long after <coughs> Jesus' crucifixion, Peter is addressing the crowd. He says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him. As you yourselves know, this man has, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We believe that Jesus Christ came into this world. He lived among us. Ultimately, he was placed upon a cross where he died, and he died for our sins. It may be hard to understand how that happens, but this is how God chose to redeem us. And Jesus' body was placed in a tomb, and three days later, he came out of that grave, and he's alive today. We serve a risen Savior today. He didn't just die. He rose from the grave, and he's alive you're here this morning, if you've never taken the opportunity to walk through the, the door that Jesus has opened for you, hear this. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. His name is Jesus. We want to give you an opportunity to respond to Jesus this morning. But also we want to give you an opportunity if God's placed a particular calling in your life an area of missions. It may be just simply going on a, a trip, uh, but it also may be a particular area of mission. Uh, Maybe one of the, com the compassion uh, ministries that were mentioned this morning. It may be a particular area of ministry within our own community. Or perhaps God is calling you into missions, and it's time for you to say yes to him. We want you to know that God has opened doors, and it's time for us to walk through them. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your spirit to touch our hearts this morning. To lead us, Father, that we would not ignore what you're, what you're saying to us. Father, if there's a need to put down the banner of religion, to set aside, Father, the traditions and the rituals that we have clung to so that we can see Jesus and realize that it's only Jesus that we need. This service, Father, began by drawing our attention to our need for a Savior. So, Father, we want to draw that attention back to the reality all of us need a Savior. Your scripture says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are 
are saved by grace and grace alone, not by works, lest any man should boast. For the wages of sin is death. The gift of Jesus Christ is eternal life. Oh, Father, save us today. Break through the, the barriers of unbelief, the confusion and the deception. we sing this song of invitation this is one of the things that Pastor Lewis was referring to if you're relatively new to the Baptist church this may be awkward, it may be different we just, we sing this song and we offer an opportunity for you to respond by walking forward and coming and speaking to me or another staff member and letting us know how God is working in your heart or to let us know you'd like to know more about Jesus, that we can answer questions and pray with you So the altars here if you just simply want to come and just thank God for what he has already done in your life or perhaps make a commitment to him in that way as well would you stand this morning as we sing this is your opportunity to respond great is thy faithfulness O God my Father there is shadow of turning with thee thou changest not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been now forever will be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see and all I have needed thy hand hath provided great
Let's pray. Father, we, um, we ask your blessing upon this offering. Father, it is a joy to be able to give back to you. And in a very small way to contribute to the advancement of your kingdom all over this world. And I pray, Father, that this offering truly would be a reflection of our love for you. For you have given your all to us. Bless it. Send it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep right at the fork to continue on Virginia 195 West. Dear David Platt, I hope my donation through the Make-A-Wish Foundation will assist the International Mission Board's efforts to spread the gospel among the unreached people groups around the world. Are we here for a visit with um, David? Okay. I still desire to engage with the people myself. However, it must not have been God's will for me to do so before the expiration of my wish on my 21st birthday. I thought you might be interested in learning about my story and life-threatening medical condition, so I have included my story below. In fifth grade, on February 14th, 2007, I suffered my first hemorrhagic stroke and was diagnosed with an arteriovenous malformation, AVM, in my brain. The doctors determined that it is too risky to surgically remove. The left side of my body was paralyzed from the stroke, but after months of intensive physical and occupational therapy, I regained complete use of my body again. For the next four years, I did not experience any severe medical complications from the AVM and Make-A-Wish began processing my original wish for my family and I to have a vacation in Australia. In the summer of 2011, however, I suffered my second hemorrhagic stroke. I never regained complete use of my left arm and hand. The ongoing pain and fatigue increased after this stroke as well. On January 3rd, 2012 and February 9th, 2012, I experienced my third and fourth strokes and was not able to travel. We decided to postpone granting my wish until I became more stable. I hope to meet you one day and serve the unreached with you. Hi, nice to meet you. Great to meet you. Great to meet you too. Really, really good to meet you. Yeah, yeah, and sorry, Dave. Michael, it's good to meet you. Hi, I'm Amy. Hey, Amy. So nice to meet you. It's good to meet you all. Yeah, here, y'all want to come back? Yeah, that'd be great. So. I can't tell you how excited I am about this. How are you doing now? Um, I mean, I'm doing fairly good. I guess yeah. I would say it's kind of like on a day-to-day -day thing. Mm. Sometimes I have like more fatigue than other days. And mm. So what's God doing in your life right now? After my second stroke, which was in ninth mm. grade, once I actually saw that just like when my body was paralyzed and I needed my mom to bathe me because I was too weak to and I couldn't balance myself. That's, I don't know, somehow God made this like analogy where that's how I am spiritually. I can't bathe myself no matter how hard I try. It's just gonna keep wearing me out if I just keep trying to work and someone's gotta do it for me and that person that can do it is Jesus. I, you guys gotta be so proud of your daughter. I'm just blown away right now. Praise God for His grace. And you and you guys. Are you okay if I read your letter in chapel? Absolutely. Is that okay? There's no, no, no reason not. Okay. Father, I, I praise you for your grace and your mercy. And No matter how hard I tried, I was not able to clean myself either way. Through the suffering, God has continued to demonstrate His faithfulness and changed my desires to use my Make-A-Wish to make an eternal impact. I want to share with you a letter that uh, I received in my office one day uh, with a check from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So here's the letter. Dear David Platt, I hope my donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation will assist the International Mission Board's efforts to spread the gospel among the unreached people. After much prayer and consideration of how best to strategically use this wish to glorify God within the time constraints and other limitations, I determined a donation through the IMB for the unreached people groups would be an eternally effective way to utilize the wish. Uh, this is the picture of the family that we get to be a part of. Just a few months ago, get news about how severe what the plan was, and on the way to the hospital, in the middle of tears, Madeline says to her mom, I just want to be a part of getting the gospel to those who've never heard it. And that was what was on her mind. 
when she was going to the hospital. Brothers and sisters, if I could, I want to introduce you to Madeline Ray. Will you come up here with me, Madeline? for every one of our lives in this room, for a Madeline-like perspective, even in the midst of challenges in front of us. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on that which matters most eternally. We pray, O oh God, that you would use her gift and how it multiplies from there for the spread of the gospel to people who've never heard it, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The reality is, uh, none of us know how much time we got. So may we live with an eternal urgency today. We want to encourage you to prayerfully consider giving towards the advancement of the gospel. This church sends out groups throughout the year, and we have a variety of ministries and, and partners in ministry and missionaries we support as well. This is an opportunity we have next Sunday morning to receive a special offering to help pay for some of those who are going out to help pay their way. Most of those who go will pay a third out of their own pocket. The church will pay a third out of our regular budget, but then we help them raise another third of those funds. And that's what next week's special offering is for. I want to ask you just to seriously spend some time this week praying about that. I do want to point out it is an offering. An offering is above our tithes. In other words, we first give our tithes to the church, and then we give above that uh, for special offerings and so forth. If we, don't, if we don't give to the offering, excuse me, our tithes to the church, in other words, if we perhaps took what we would have given to the church and give it to a special offering, then we actually are undermining uh, the mission effort. You see, our church has almost $200,000 budgeted each year to go to, uh, to advancing the gospel and sharing the, the name of Jesus to the lost. That's almost 21% of our annual budget. And so it, 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 we, we first give there, and then we give above that. And what I ask you to do is don't, don't just be thinking right now and later today oh. think, oh, I've got a little extra money here or there, I can do this. I want you to spend some time in prayer. Our missions committee has worked hard for this, and they want you to pray about what God would place upon your heart. So you just spend some time and say, God, what, what, what would you have me to do? And when that amount begins to come into your life, you begin to re it begins to resonate in your, your thoughts, at first you're going to think, oh, I can't do that, or how is that going to happen? Don't get fixated on it. Just simply listen to him. And then begin to pray about how he might help you to make that offering. There may be something that God may put upon your heart that you don't need anymore, and you might sell it. There may be something that you feel you need. It may be a sacrifice, and you might choose no longer to have that anymore in your life. But if you'll seek him, he'll help you. He'll provide the resources for that. But that'll be next Sunday, uh, near the end of next Sunday service, we'll be receiving that special offering. So I wanted you to have an opportunity to come and be prepared for that. So spend some time in prayer for that. Let's close out our service by uh, by celebrating what God has done. Lyle, come stand next to me. This is Lyle Smithy. Lyle has come forward this morning to unite with our church family and membership. Uh, he knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, he's coming uh, by baptism, so he'll be baptized in the, the weeks ahead uh, to, to represent the change of, of heart and life that's happened uh, when, when he received Jesus Christ uh, a number of years ago. And uh, um, I believe he's in the young professionals. Right, that's right. Yeah, so uh, that, that's the, the uh, there you go. Come stand next to Lyle, if you would, representing our church. And, um, you know, oftentimes an individual comes to our church by, by being invited by uh, another member, which we celebrate and encourage that members. Um, Lyle actually started coming here as an invitation from one of our guests uh, who's been attending. So uh, we're, we're grateful for how God is working in the life of so many families here at Calvary. And we, we want to make sure that he gets the praise today and he 
gets the glory for that. But Lyle, I want you to hear what I say to everybody that joins the church. We're far better with you than we ever could be without you. It'd be my heart's desire, our church's heart's desire, that you'll always find us faithful to care and minister to you, to be there with you in the good days and to be with you in some of the difficult days that life may bring about. Also, we pray that we'll find you faithful and uh, in, in your um, connectedness with us and your participation and using your gifts and abilities in and through the life of this church family, ultimately to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. And that's what we celebrate today. Church, if you're excited about this, would you let them know? He's going to stay right there. Members come by and greet him and welcome him to Calvary. God bless you. Thank you for being here. And don't forget to pray for your offering for next week.